to the Golden Hour Podcast Experience with your hosts, David Altizer and Connor McCaskill. Let's go, you mother truckers. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Hey. Let's get to the meat of it, right out of the meat of the video out of the way here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, are we sh- Here we have it. The S52 X 5X, whatever it's called, S52X. Yeah, we both have one in hand. We do. Mine Look has a lens, and yours doesn't. No, these are not these are not S52s that we Sharpie markered together. This is the real deal. I have my lens uh, cap on upside down. I just realized, so that's exciting. Yeah, it's really the most beautiful camera that uh, I've ever seen from a standard manufacturer, not including a Leica, but <laughs> or Fujifilm. But what's cool is uh, Panasonic, I know, you know, they work with Leica. And so they have a little bit of taste. They understand. So not bad, man. Not bad. They grayed out the top here. Um, All the buttons are completely dark. If my camera will focus. Uh, Save for Um, that red record button. They they left that standout red. I have mixed feelings on it. I love... I, I kind of like it in a way because it's really easy to find the record button. It's like, well, there it is. Bam. I think unfortunately that is just kind of like, look, this is this makes it practical. You're going to be on set. Right. It's going to be really dark, and you're like, dang it, where's the record button? You know? Yeah, everyone's so, going to have a S five two X like flashlight that they carry, so they could like, turn <laughs> yeah. it on and be like, what setting am I in? Uh, oh, so yeah. I I think that's a good move. I think it's a smart move to to do that. It also it's kind of almost a branding thing with Lumix too, because they've had these red buttons for a while now. Yeah. Um, but I think I do. I think mostly it's just people are going to be shooting in the dark, and they wanted to make sure that you could see it. Right. You know? I do think I agree with you though. I think it's probably one of the best, just like standard. I, I hesitate. To, it's not flagship camera, I guess. Right. It, uh, yeah. Or is it this I don't think th- Panasonic would say that. They're yeah. They're they're calling it like a. It, it's definitely. It's pretty dang flagship. I'm I not know. Gonna lie, for a video shooter, it's feature complete uh, in my eyes, which is exciting because lots of cameras are not feature complete uh, these days. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're they're very great. They're they're all great, uh, but they're always like little oops and umps that they don't have. And it feels like Lumix just said, "No more of that crap." Here's everything we can possibly slam into a twenty two hundred dollar crazy camera body. Uh, Connor, I asked you to put together a list of um, differences between the S5 II and the S5 IIx. Do you have those on hand by chance? Yeah, I do. Um, so actually, interestingly, the differences are, I'm going to use the word minimal. They're actually relatively similar. So it is just a $200 difference between them. The realistic difference that you're getting with the S5 IIx over the regular S5 II is you are getting higher megabits per second. So you're able to record in all I and long gop, whereas the uh, regular one is just uh, IPB, I believe. Um, so that is probably one of the larger differences. Uh, as of recording this video, we are allowed to say that the S5 IIx is going to be able to do Blackmagic RAW out to the Blackmagic Video Assist, the 5 and the 7 inch, which is crazy. That's really cool. But I did find in the uh, information that they gave us that the S5 II will be able to do that as well uh, with an unlock code. So that's not necessarily unique to the... Um, X. It's just something that you have to like, I think you pay $200, the difference of the two cameras, it's just the licensing. You're paying for the license because you have to license those uh, codecs. Uh, yeah. And obviously Lumix isn't going to pay for that. So you're yeah. going to pay for it. So if you want to upgrade your regular S5 II, maybe you don't care for the blacked out design and you want to get the S5 II, well, you can still buy the features and upgrade it to be the same. Or if you want to you just want to save the 200 now by the S5 too. And when your job calls for that feature down the line, you can always upgrade it later. Right. Um, but you are getting, it's up to 800 megabits per second in cinema 4k and regular 4k and then 400 mm-hmm. megabits per second in full HD, which you're not getting as far as I understand it in the regular S5 too. And then also the other difference is you can do wired and wireless IP streaming uh, through USB um, with the X. What exactly is that? Do you know off the top of your head what IP streaming is? is that- I, I am I am not a live stream guy, uh, to be honest with you. I don't 100% know. I think it's something to do with like 
you can stream right off the camera and then the camera like gotcha. pushes it to the computer and then it goes up without mm -hmm. the need for, I have no idea, Dave, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I really don't care about live streaming. Like, yeah. It's some sort of USB Wi-Fi feature. Like you can plug it in over you. I mean, you can already use the S5 II as a webcam. In fact, that's what I'm doing right now. What you're seeing right now is actually the S5 II, the standard normal non X version as my webcam. And, uh, it works fine. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to use like a special, uh, box or anything like that. I can just plug it straight into the, um, computer over USB using their software. Um, so I'm not completely sure what the, uh, live streaming capability is here. We'll have to talk to an expert about that, but I mean, let's just be honest. If, <laughs> if you're a video shooter um, and you can afford the extra 200 bucks, I'd say this one looks really cool and it does have better bit rates. Um, so that is a valid, you know, a valid upgrade there. So, and whatever the S two H is going to be, which, you know, I don't even know if that's what it's called. We don't know anything about that but camera. That style is what you're really referencing, but that that's going to be the flagship, you know, camera. And then this will become kind of your like a seven four type equivalent. Whereas the S two H is going to be like the a seven S like just the top of the top in terms of uh, hybrid cameras from Panasonic. And so, you know, this camera is always going to be cheaper than whatever that flagship actually is from Panasonic. So, um, for 2,200 bucks, I mean, you can't really compete with that. I think that's the price of the new, um, What's the one that you just reviewed These, with Sony? The uh, ZVE-1. ZVE-1. Yeah. Isn't that the same price? It is the same price. And sorry, Sony, but this Lumix is a far better deal for what you're getting. <laughs> uh, there's just, yeah. I mean, you're, it's a six, you can do 6K open gate, which is crazy. Uh, then yeah. you have Cinema 4K, ProRes internal, you know, 422 color space. It's it's pretty nuts what this thing's able to do. And they managed it's to black. <laughs> yeah. It's all blacked out of course, but they, they snuck a fan underneath, which you probably yeah. definitely can't see in my video, but maybe Dave, you can see it. I see it. Yeah. They snuck a fan in there, which is great. Cause it's going to help with all the overheating. Cause this thing is outputting such crazy specs. Um, you got to keep it cool. Uh, and they managed to do that somehow. It's pretty, and I've heard with the, pretty great. with the ACE, with the ZVE one, uh, from Sony, I've heard some quite a bit of overheating stories from different people. Um, so, you know, very, and it's got full size HDMI on it. Um, ju you know, all the features that we love about the S5 II um, are, are in here, obviously. It's, it's essentially an S5 II, just with a few little minor differences. And I'm curious too, if, if there is any hardware differences, I don't think there is. I think it's all software maybe, but the fact that you can do higher bit rates on it is interesting. So I'm not sure. Um, I think it's all, you know, I think it's all software. So you're kind of paying for the Apple license and the black magic license and all that stuff. Basically, that um, when I was talking to the Panasonic guys, uh, they were just saying that they didn't want to charge you for features that maybe you wouldn't use. So if someone was purchasing this and they didn't need like, realistically, we don't need those crazy bit rates for what we do technically. Sure. Um, so if we didn't want to pay for those features, we wouldn't have to, we could just buy the S five too. But if you're someone who is doing production work and you do want to use those extra high bit rates, uh, and whatever else, um, you had that option. You just had to pay a little bit more, which I think is a great strategy. It's like, a great idea. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's, um, like, I would like to see that be incorporated in the market as a whole. It's like, why are we like, there should just be two variants. It's almost like a photographer variant almost you could say. And then yeah, like, like a, a, a video uh, variant. Totally. But the funny thing is, is even the S five two by itself is such a heavy hitter for video by itself too. Like without all the X features. So I don't, I do not want to discount the quality of just the two by itself. Cause it's fantastic as well. Um, but I think they definitely know their audience. I think one of the coolest things about Lumix is uh, two of the main guys in America that kind of operate the Lumix division, uh, Sean and Matt, um, who we know and met uh, over the years going to conventions and stuff. They're video guys. Like Matt is kind of in charge of a lot of this and he really understands uh, video cameras and he really gets what we all want as shooters. 
And you can just tell with the software and the features built into all the Lumix cameras, not just these here, you know, things like shutter angle and waveforms and the fantastic focus options. Uh, in fact, on my S5 II that I'm using to live stream right now, I have what they have called uh, focus limiting. So like I had it basically like if I go beyond this point here, it won't even focus on me because I limited it to like where I'm sitting and then just like a little closer. Yeah. So and if that you way, know there's like a specific focusing window, it's not going to just mm-hmm. jump to the background. Yeah. Although it should be smart enough to know since I'm just having this little green screen behind me, it, it should be smart enough to know not to focus on that. Of course. I mean, obviously it should be, but what's great is that you have the option to make sure that nothing happens, which is obviously great. 100%. So I do think it's important for both Connor and I to mention both of these cameras were given to us by Panasonic. It's true. Uh, We were not paid to talk about it, but um, we do have these cameras on a loan, essentially. Um, And so thank you, Panasonic, for sending us these cameras as well as the lenses. I've got the uh, 24 millimeter F1.8 here. I've got the... That's what I got right here. 50 millimeter as well. 50 millimeter uh, F1.8. You got the 24. Yep. I think the 24 and the 50 are two of the best ones. Um, you, what do you think of the 85? I haven't messed with it. I've never used it. I, that's a focal length that I never use. Oh, so. okay. Interesting. I'm not an 85 guy. I usually would never go further than 50. So, okay. personally. Fair enough. I like compression. Um, <laughs> I love, I love, so I'll probably try it out. Do it. Do it. So, s 52 x if you haven't pulled the trigger yet on a Lumix and you're waiting for this camera... I think now's the time, you know, you should be able to, to order it, pre-order it. I'm not sure about the uh, shipping on it. And I whatnot. was told, um, don't hold me to it, like early-ish June. Maybe first or second week it of June. It says shipping, on B&H it says shipping will begin Wednesday, May 31st. Okay, yeah, so June. So you can totally pre-order it now and you should be able to receive it fairly quickly. I would imagine that these aren't going to really move that many. I don't know, we'll have to see because... I just feel like a lot of people probably bought the S5 II already, so these might not sell as much. But then again, there's a lot of video nerds out there who have been waiting for this, and man, is it beautiful. It is a gorgeous camera. I love the blacked out buttons, and I think it takes a lot of courage to uh, do that. I, I would imagine that whoever came up with that idea, I don't know if it was Matt or Sean, but <laughs> somehow they convinced the engineers and the designers to allow this, and um, it technically is not a good design because it's hard to read, uh, and, especially at nighttime. And branding as well. And branding as well. Yeah, I mean, they've totally blacked out the Lumix logo. I know. Uh, so it's hard to tell what it is from a distance or like if you had it rigged out, there's no obvious yeah. branding. Uh, but it just looks so good. But it just looks amazing. And so it's kind of like, okay, look, our audience loves this stuff. If we just do it, they're going to buy it because it looks awesome. Yeah. And, and they're going to the, stick a the, piece of gaff over it anyways. Yeah. The gaffer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now that now it'll look better because there's no gaff table and you'll sort of see the logo. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm going to probably say I'll, I'll probably be seeing these a lot, you know, just around town, you know, other shooters and stuff. Um, I won't see, I, I guarantee you almost no photographers will buy this body. Uh, <laughs> so this is a pretty much full-time video person camera, um, which is cool. And that's kind of what Panasonic has always been leaning into anyways. I really love how analog it all feels too. Like there's just lots of switches and toggles on this camera, which is great. Like you have the single continuous and manual on the back as a little switch. You know, you had the circular dials on the top, which look great on and off switch dedicated white balance dedicated iso i mean it's the s5 too so it, it's the same um mm-hmm. except for those design cue features but i just think that they did a good job making everything feel pretty good you know again for because you got to yeah. consider this is a cheap camera right yeah i mean it's t- for, for what it is and for what it's doing it's performing next to like an a7s or an fx3 for you know, a thousand dollars cheaper. Exactly. I mean, like even the flip screen, like it's chunky. It it feels really snappy. Like it doesn't feel Mm -hmm. like it's gonna, I mean, I haven't used it very long, but it doesn't feel like it's going to wear out. Like it feels robust. 
I don't know how they save money. <laughs> I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out like where did, I mean, it is very light. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the plastic, I mean, but it's not completely plasticky at all, but I, I guess, yeah, maybe they're saving some money with some of the materials. I don't know, but it's yeah. still weather sealed. Even with the fan, it's actually weather sealed with the fan. So, you know, this is a better, this is a more, um, <clears throat> This is my C70 here, which I may be getting rid of soon because it's just now that I have two Lumix bodies, um, they this is becoming a little redundant and it's so wonderful. I do love the image off of this, but um, this isn't weather sealed. You know, if it started to rain, you're going to get water in the camera here, which isn't great. It's also bigger and heavier. And um, weirdly, the the screen build quality is worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's so terrible. This little flip screen is all floppy. So I was going to send this in to Canon, have them fix the screen and then probably sell it. But I don't know. I feel like I would shed a, shed a tear as well because I do love it. But it's, you're like um, the, uh, it's like your 1DC. Like you keep going back to it. Now it'll be the C70. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I think the image is um, is, is incredible. And I, I do love having the indie filters and all my audio stuff. Um, there's something about having a, a true cinema camera. And so Lumix, if you're watching, I really am excited about, you know, whatever technology that's inside of here being put into some sort of cinema camera with NDs. That would be nice if we could get, man, it, it would be super cool if we could get a camera of this size with ND filters. <laughs> like I would give up, I would sacrifice IBIS for built-in NDs. Mm. So if that's possible, yeah, I would take it. I think I agree if the lenses you all have would be like if, the lenses had really good stabilization. I would agree with that. Well, almost none of them have, none of them have stabilization. I know. Because they all they, are trusting that the IBIS is so good. They, they, so. they fully committed to the internal system, which is, it works great, of course. But that would be the issue, right? If you lost IBIS for ND and then your lenses don't have stabilization either. I mean, that's, that's a rough life. Yeah, well, I mean, but it's a cinema camera, so you're going to be putting it on a gimbal anyway. So, and a lot of cinema shooters don't want IBIS because true. the car mount. What you were talking about in this size body, but yes, true. Well, look, I mean, look at the R5C. They they removed the IBIS from that camera because cinematographers don't want it. That is true. You, you're you correct. But they also didn't give us ND internal. <laughs> I know. It might not be possible because the flange distance is too small, but if it wasn't filters, maybe you could do something like what the FX6 does from Sony, which is like, um, it's basically just a piece of glass that has like a chemical reaction of some sort. It's some sort of like crazy uh, chemical that I don't know how it works. The variable ND that's built in. Yeah, that is actually great tech. I would love to see that just bleed down into everything. Yeah. That Honestly. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the S5 2X. We're really excited about it. But there's also, I kind of hinted at it myself here, um, talking about the C70, and I'm still, I need to pray about what to do. I think it's kind of obvious. I should probably sell it. But um, I do think it's time to embrace the Lumix because if you really think about it objectively, everything that I've wanted in a hybrid camera is here now with this camera. And I also can trust that based off of what I'm seeing here with this budget camera, that whatever the S2H is going to be, the flagship, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So um, whatever features that this has that I love, and by the way, that doesn't even, you know, maybe the, S5, the S2H will come, maybe we'll do a review and they won't give them out as freely because they're, they're so much more expensive and we won't be able to keep it, but maybe we could do a review on it or whatever to so get some hands on. And it's like, well, do I really want to spend 3500 or, you know, 4900 for this? No, I, I don't need it because the S5 2X and the S5 II are so good on their own. Um, but I'm just saying, like, you know, there's still going to be a GH7 down the line. I love Micro Four Thirds and would love to get back into that. Um, you know, you've got all the future S cameras and then I'm such a Leica nerd. The fact that Panasonic and Leica have a partnership and their glass and their optics all work together, that gets me super excited and super nerdy as well. The fact that Leica and Lumix are kind of one you know, company is, makes me smile. 
all that to say, like I've been a Canon, sh- I've been a Canon shooter for ever since the, kind of the DSLR revolution. I took a little time with black magic and switched over to the original black magic cinema camera and the original pocket camera. Uh, but then I went right back to Canon again with the one DC and then, you know, into the, uh, EOS R and then now into the C70 for the last two years. And I have been a happy Canon camper, and I think there's something to be said of their optics and then their color science. But they continue to disappoint me with their firmware, uh, their lack of firmware updates, especially for video shooters. And their lack of lens lineup is quite depressing as well. The fact that they're not opening it up to third parties. Canon just seems like they got to stick up their butt all the time. And... Sony doesn't excite me at all. I'm sorry. Like, I know there's a lot of Sony listeners that listen to this show. So hopefully you're not cringing at this, but like, there's just something about Sony that just doesn't resonate with me. It just, it feels too foreign to me. And, uh, (laughs) that's, hopefully that doesn't come out wrong, but I just mean foreign choice of words, but I know what you're saying. It's, it's just a different ecosystem. Yeah. It's like, it's as much of an iOS to Android type of feeling is what I kind of am trying to explain here. Um, and I just don't like it. I don't like how like the font choice that they have is terrible. The menu system is obnoxious. <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the font there, choice. That there, feels so nitpicky. I love it though. I feel like their cameras don't inspire me at all. Like none of they don't there's not a single camera that Sony owns that makes me want to shoot with it when I look at it. <laughs> and it! look at how cool this is. S52X. It's all black. Like who's going to do that? That's so cool. And it's got the, it's got the boxy kind of almost like a f- styling in a lot of ways too, but the, it's their own Lumix look, which is a nice kind of sharp. Um, I mean, Sony has that too, but it's a, no, it's um, a, I think uh, Lumix has a more boxy look to it, but it looks good. Yeah, it, it looks good. It, 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 yeah. It's, it's chunky, but it's cool. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't even really say that the Lumix is all that inspiring either, though, at the end of the day. But what is inspiring is just the feature set that they have here. The fact that when I use this camera, I kind of feel like, oh, these people get me. They're including the things that I want. They're speaking my language, if you will, uh, as a video shooter. Um, and of course, Sony does have the FX3 and the FX6 and the FX30, which is a great affordable cinema camera. I think those cameras are probably more of what I would choose if I were to go Sony as an FX30 or an FX3. Um, And they have actually updated things there with their menu system that actually looks really good. And they've finally added, you know, anamorphic support, but it's just kind of there. Like it's, they just seem to sort of hesitate you know, with their firmware updates, I know a lot of Sony users are frustrated with the lack of cohesiveness with their firmware. Um, but, and again, I just feel like the lenses on the Lumix are fantastic. The color science is really, really good. Um, and their IBIS is best in class. I've never seen such good IBIS on a full frame sensor. It's the best. Um, I think Dave, we've, we've said for a long time that the only thing, the only thing holding back Lumix was their autofocus. And we yep. know with the S5 II, when we got to use it and now you own it, um, they fixed that and now it works out great because they went to the phase detect. And then yep. with the X now stepping up with even more video features than the S5 II, although the S5 II is still a wonderful camera. It's like, also don't forget it's 2200 bucks or less. Yep. It's like, yeah. man, they really were just, I think what they wanted to do, and I think hopefully they're succeeding in this is they wanted to give you no reason not to choose them. And I I think they did a wonderful job with that. I I think you're, (laughs) I think you're right in a lot of ways. Like I do like Sony when I use Sony cameras, like when I shoot with Armando and stuff, I'm like, ah, this is great. Cause it kind of is like, there's just some really great things about Sony cameras that Canon for instance, doesn't have. Cause you know, those are kind of like the two, Titans, so to speak, um, that are always fighting for dominance, uh, Canon and Sony. Uh, and I think Sony has been doing very well to defeat Canon lately, but <laughs> yeah. I, I think that Lumix kind of being, I, I don't want to call them an underdog, but just kind of like, they're, they're kind of coming out of left field with this stuff. And I think it's very exciting. And I, I do think that if you haven't even considered trying these Lumix cameras, now would be a great time, maybe not even to purchase them immediately, but just rent one. And see if you like yeah. it. 
um, play around with it. Because again, it's just the the price. And specifically the S5 II and beyond cameras. Because that being said, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people that use the GH5 still. And then of course the GH6, which came out uh, recently. Those are great. But I think, especially if you're somebody that likes autofocus, or maybe even if you're not an autofocus person at all, getting the S5 II, doing a, you know, a rental with it and trying the autofocus system, it's really right in line with, you know, some of the greats. I wouldn't put it in a Sony or Canon class, but it's definitely, you know, in the Canon ballpark in terms of reliability. I have noticed as I've been talking here, it's kind of, I mean, it just did it. It kind of has been going out a little bit. I've been noticing that too, actually. So we might be talking it up maybe just a little too much. (laughs) I set my limiter. I I put it uh, one step down on like locked on, so it wouldn't uh, move around too much. But I, you know, maybe it's my glasses and the microphone that's kind of throwing it off. So I don't know. I don't uh, know what you have it set up into. I know when we used it in Japan, it was surprisingly sticky. Um, yeah. How uh, like even when we did a test where you you had me walk really really far away it was yeah. holding on me for a long long time and it seemed to be pretty sticky um so i'm curious what you have it set in right now yeah i, I kind of it's fairly default i just have um i have it set to the human tracking or no i have it on face and eye cuz i know i'm only going to be looking at it <laughs> so uh this couldn't be a more simple task. I, I have a perfectly lit scene with me in the front with a green screen behind me. So um, I don't think this could get much more simple. So if it's not going to track my eyes in this scenario, which are obstructed by my glasses, but you know, a Sony or Canon would have no problem with that. So true. Um, so maybe not as good as Canon or Sony, but it's still huge <laughs> better than Fuji. <laughs> it's still a huge improvement over the. Um, other competition and itself its previous self so it's still great yeah we'd love to see it and you know theoretically can only get better because this is the first time they're really messing with this yeah it it will continue to get better so i think it's kind of like you can kind of bet your cards on it in a way like by by getting in now if you're on the fence or if you're ready to kind of upgrade your systems maybe you have some older cameras and you've been kind of just looking at the industry and trying to figure out and especially if you're even coming from canon or sony um and you're kind of ready to pull the trigger on like an r6 mark ii or a a7 IV. if you're kind of in that price range and you're considering buying an a7 IV or an r6 ii really consider this one i think in that price bracket this is actually cheaper than those two cameras And I think it is giving you a lot more, especially if you're a video shooter, which I would assume the majority of our listeners are. Right. If you're, if you're more photographer, not saying the S5 II uh, is not a good photography camera, but there probably is like more argument to go with maybe the R6 Mark II or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think you were telling me that the R6 Mark II is the best selling mirrorless on the market right now, Uh, just in general. Based on some random article I read. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, I, I, th- I thought it was on Petapixel or something, but yeah, it was Can't like, remember. so, I mean, Canon is just crushing it as always because they have the photography market on lock. Like there's a lot of photographers that just kind of associate professional photography, whether you're a wedding photographer or portrait photographer or whatever, they're like, Oh, I'll buy a Canon. I, I do feel, I do wonder how much of Canon's market is legacy because people have so much invested in glass and i know this is switched to rf but it's still kind of still the same like if you have ef glass and you wanted to upgrade your 5d4 or whatever or yeah just whatever um 1dx mark ii chances Mm -hmm. are you're still going to go with canon to stay in that same ecosystem and then just adapt your lenses and then eventually get rf glass that's what my cousins did they bought the r6 mark ii and fell in love with it and they started buying more lenses so i feel like if like the people who are coming up and that are new um uh, from what i can tell seem to all be picking sony for the most part Mm -hmm. or for some reason the fujifilm x100v and making it impossible for me to buy one uh thank you (laughs) everybody who bought that and is keeping me from having one appreciate that Totally. <laughs> if anyone has one, message me on Instagram if you don't want it anymore. I will buy it. <laughs> I, 
I, at a fair price. At a fair price. Fuji, I even, I reached out to Fujifilm themselves and they're like, bro, we can't even get them. I was like, oh, sick. Is, is it partly because it's just not available and that's why you want it? Because like we've had opportunities to buy it in the past and I never was that interested in picking one up myself. So I'm still I not. was wanting one, but I had the X-T3 and then the X-T4. So I didn't really see a need. Holy to... crap. They're selling for $1,800, $2,000 on eBay right yeah, now. Yeah, I know. It So when I had the X-T3 and the X-T4, I didn't feel like, I was like, well, that camera's kind of already doing that for me. Over time, as I got the R6 II or the R5, the X-T4 just kind of was sitting in a drawer for the most uh -huh. part because I just didn't have many opportunities to use it because I didn't want to like deal with another camera with more interchangeable lenses, you know, all that stuff. So I thought, well, shoot, if I had a X100V, I could still get that Fujifilm charm, but then it's a fixed lens and I could just slot it in my bag and be done with it. And I went to go try to find one. And then I found out apparently they got super popular recently. Uh, and yeah, you, after COVID. Yeah. Kind of blew up on TikTok and stuff. I don't know what, ha I, I don't have TikTok. So that's probably why I had no idea what was happening. Um, and you can't find them. I was talking to one of the Fujifilm guys at NAB and he was saying that B and H has like a 3000 units on back order and they mm -hmm. got their shipment in for the month. Uh, guess how many they got? I would assume it's low if you're asking me to guess, but I'll say a thousand. Eight. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> they got what's going on. They got eight. Why can't they make them? That's terrible business. If, if, if business is booming, it's their job to up production because that equals more money. Um, maybe they just like maybe they're still figuring out the production on the X one hundred, you know, six. Right? Is that is that what it's going to be? Well, on the V now. So. Uh, well, before the one before it was an F. So I don't know. Um, okay, but yeah, they're probably. I mean, I feel like I've been saying this for almost like a year now, where it's like, oh yeah, they're probably just waiting for the new one, so that way they don't waste time building the old one. But it's like, look, take a note from Apple. Like they they keep older phones up in their lineup, or they even use older processors uh, in cheaper, like SE phones, because once they've made, you know, several million units, they figure out like how to do it perfectly and how to get the cost down. And as technology marches on, the older technology should get cheaper for the most part. So it's like, even if they introduced a new X100, they should still be producing the X100V for a period of time because there's going to be so many normie people who don't care about whatever new features are there and they're going to just want to buy the X100 V. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's strange that they haven't figured it out. Like if they like money, then why aren't they just <laughs> figuring it out? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I, I do feel like you're partially right. They're probably working on the next one and they weren't, I'm assuming expecting this one to just randomly pop off like two or three years after it came out. However old the camera is, I can't really remember. Um, so they probably didn't know what to do with the newfound popularity. They're probably just going to let it ride out and then they'll hopefully in their eyes, maybe cap, uh, capitalize on this new camera whenever it comes out. I wonder if they're taking their sweet time with it because maybe it got popular. Maybe they want to make sure this new one's really good. Uh, I don't know. It feels like it should have been like announced or something by now. It's been a while. I think it'll be cool. I, if they made an X100 with a 28 millimeter equivalent, I'd buy it in an instant. But <laughs> yeah, you, I don't you're like, a big 28 guy. I don't like the 35. If I'm only going to have one lens, I want a 28 because it's a little wider. And for my lifestyle and the way I shoot, you know, with the kids and stuff, they are just running around like crazy. And I like to get kind of close to them. And 28 is the perfect focal length for me with the kids because just, you know, we're, I'm usually in a small kind of corner of the room or whatever. And, it's just the right focal length for the way I like to shoot. So I wish more people made 28s. It's a very unknown. I mean, other than the Leica Q, that's why I love the Leica because they Leica always has 28s. They Leica people love 28s because it's a street shooting uh, thing. So I, I have actually been looking at maybe picking up the GR3, which we reviewed so many years ago. Oh yeah, that little the guy. Ryko because that's a 28. Okay. And um, I forgot about the images that on that. Remember when we reviewed that in uh, San Juan Capistrana? Yeah. Uh, is that what it's called? Yeah, that's San right. Juan? Capistrana. Yeah. It was beautiful, man. That was good times, good times. But yeah, uh, um, yeah, I, 
I loved the pictures coming off of that. It's such a random company, Ryko, but um, man, it was it had some really great image quality. I remember, and it, it's so tiny. It's definitely something you could just throw in your pocket, uh, which is super fun. So I would go for a GR over the Fuji myself. But dude, that came out four years ago. Holy crap! The GR three, April twenty fifth, two thousand nineteen. That's when we posted that video. Jeez, that's crazy. Good times. That was. Man, that was a whole year before COVID. Holy cow. We were just living so it's such a go lucky life there. Yep, yeah, high on life <laughs> before the world yeah. burned. Anyways. Yeah, we were in that apartment in Laguna. Oh man, good times. Yeah. It was such a short lived but fun time. It was so short. It felt like a long time, but then I thought about it and it was October, the end of October, the very end of October for me, until yeah. um I think the end of May. Mm-hmm. So I and was then, really short lived there. Then even California too. Like I, I feel like I lived there for so long, but it, we only lived there for two and a half years. <laughs> so it wasn't that long at all. Yeah. I would have been 20, the end well, of you 2018. And I so 2019, 2020. And then I left in 2021. Yeah. So two and a half years. Yeah. We, we pretty much like you moved home. Not, not long after I moved home. Right. Yeah. So, just like a month or two. Yeah. So Anyways, are you going to switch to a Lumix camera as your main camera, Connor? Here's what I'll say. I need to use it way more before I come up with that decision. But Mm. I do agree with you that jumping on the Lumix bandwagon now feels like a really great idea. So if I use this camera and I just enjoy the heck out of it, which is what I feel like is what's going to happen... Yeah, I, I see no problems at all switching to Lumix because again, mm-hmm. it was that one hiccup with the autofocus, uh, which we need as uh, content online content creators. It's just autofocus is totally. so useful, and if it has that and it works and everything else is great, and it has all these extra amazing features like open gate, so then that's really good for repurposing yep. into vertical content, which we all need to jump on that game as much as I hate it and want to blow my brains out. Anyways, I th- I think I think I could switch to it. I just have to use it more. I'm, I'm not the kind of person that just makes decisions on a whim. <laughs> I love that. Such a long pause that makes decisions on, on a, a whim. whim. <laughs> yeah. I, um, so I've, I've obviously had more hands on time with it than you, uh, because I've had the S five two since December and I've used it quite a bit as a daily kind of camera with my kids and stuff. Um, I miss Micro Four Thirds, but the great thing is, is Panasonic makes Micro Four Thirds cameras. So yeah. Um, as so, I I do I sold my OM One from Olympus or OM Systems is what they're called, and I do miss the Micro Four Thirds system. Like I genuinely, actually, really did love that camera and loved the images I was getting off of it. And it's funny because like technically the sensor on this is way better than the OM-1 in terms of, you know, it's full frame. It's, you know, technically got, I think, some better specs. But if Panasonic announces kind of an OM-1 competitor, uh, I would imagine it's going to be way better than the OM-1. It'll have better autofocus for video, have better video specs, and it'll also be a great little everyday carry photography camera because I just love the teeny tiny little, uh, again, 28 millimeter equivalent, the Panasonic 15 millimeter F1.8. It's a Panasonic and Leica collab. Mm-hmm. So it's a tiny little 28 millimeter lens. I love that little thing. Um, and it looks cool. It's got like a cool little f- hood. It looks like a Leica lens, like a proper Leica M lens. Yeah. And it's my favorite focal length. So I want to use that lens again and I want it to be on a Panasonic body. So, you know. I will have the S5 X as my primary video workhorse for now. And then whatever future Micro Four Thirds camera may or may not come, that'll also be Panasonic. So yeah, I think having the, the Lumix uh, ecosystem, it's going to be great. Um, yeah. The lenses are fantastic. They really, they just make the right things because they actually are talking to video guys and they're doing what we say. Like even the kit lens is really unique. It's a 20 millimeter on the wide end to 60 mil. So, you know, they did that because they recognized that a lot of the YouTuber people needed something just a little bit wider than 24 mil. So yeah. they went ahead, they went ahead and just made a, a nice, um, you know, it's not very fast. It's a F three five, but this camera is so good in low light that, um, you're not going to really have any issues with that. And again, there will be future cameras that come out that will be even better than this. So this is just the um, beginning. 
this is literally just the beginning. This is the only camera we've seen with phase detect and yeah. um, Panasonic makes Micro Four Thirds cameras. So I'm excited about the future of Micro Four Thirds camera. And then I'm excited for just what's going to happen on the high, high end of things with the S2H and with whatever cinema options they may do in the future. So 100%. Um, I think I'm ready to say that I am ready to switch. Um, I'm not you know, a huge, huge fan of the EVF quality on this for photos. It's a, it's a fairly low resolution. Again, my OM one had a really great high res. What is the resolution so, on the S five two? Yeah. Um, it's kind it of the, the a seven four ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of in your, it's the same as like your R six or whatever. Like it's, it's in that same category of kind of the mid tier. It's 3.6 million. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same as my R six. But like, if you look at the a seven S three, that thing, has, you can't compare. To I that. know you can't, but that, I mean, that camera one is so much more money and two, it's the best on the market. If, if anything, it could be com- comparable i mean i guess you could compare it to the r5 which is a 5.67 i think but no that's that's a higher res but that's, that's significantly higher res. i know but that's but what i'm saying is like even that camera's way more expensive so so the the om1 was a 5.76 million dot so oh. i'm coming from a much higher res evf okay which interesting that the om1 you know, was that good liked. well yeah the, it's a primarily a photography based audience that uses that got it um camera so and it's mostly nature photographers because they love the micro four thirds platform because you can put a 100 mil lens that's like pretty small and that equates to 300 millimeters you know with the micro four thirds so if you're shooting birds or wildlife um there's like a bunch of wildlife based ai so it can track birds it can track animals um so there's a ton of it seems like that's almost their whole demo is like wildlife photographers. Bird, bird <laughs> photographers, got it. Yeah, because the IBIS is so good. So it's like a really long telephoto lens is only, you know, this big. So it just fits in your backpack really easily. And you can get like a 600 mil equivalent with great stabilization with bird tracking and then high buffer and then a high res display. It's just the perfect combo for those types of shooters. Um, and they're shooting it during the day so they don't need crazy good low light anyways um anyways i'm going on a tangent but (laughs) um and then i I do think like companies are made up of people and a lot of these companies i've met some of the sony people and i want to just say they clearly get it too the the people involved at sony are really fantastic i met uh was his name jay his name was jay uh that is good friends with armando i did an interview with him at the condor blue booth at NAB and he was super nice. And he's like one of the main guys in charge of like the video, um, hybrids and stuff. So, um, and he seemed to be very responsive to the feedback and the features that we want. So it, I don't want to take away from the amazing people at Sony that they're not good. Uh, My biggest, I think complaint is just being a Canon person. Like anytime I've talked to anybody from Canon, they just seem so mean. I don't know. And they don't, they don't take criticism. Well, like they don't, they're not able to kind of listen to a complaint and then actually make a difference. Whereas like Sony, they come in with a clipboard and like they say, okay, tell us everything wrong with the camera. Then they write it down and then they probably will fix it for the next time around. That's why we've seen features like, you know, even the fact that the a7S III exists the way it does with a full size HDMI and flip screen and all that, we've become used to it now, but like those were responses to our requests. And so Um, you know, I think they've heard loud and clear that their firmware needs to be addressed. So I would assume that they're going to fix that too. Well, um, I did, I think I said it previously, but, um, when we were at the camera camp last, uh, when I, when I was at the camera camp, those past one, wow. English mm -hmm. is hard today. Um, they did have a thing where they would have different creators who actively own and yeah. use Sony cameras would come in and they would be able to talk to engineers and the likes, uh, to be able to talk about like things that they would like to see things that they didn't like specifically. So they clearly are wanting to know what people who use the stuff, which totally makes sense, want to see in future cameras or want to see fixed in current cameras. Uh, and I think that is a large reason why they got that update recently with the FX three and the FX 30. So I think Sony's actually been a really great company lately 
And I think they're doing yeah. some pretty amazing things. And honestly, I still do want to get my hands on a Sony camera as well. Um, yeah. Although I selfishly just want to own every single camera brand. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm but, unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, what I was kind of getting to is just knowing, you know, Matt and Sean and meeting some of the Lumix people, they just also seem so phenomenal, very relational, very in the weeds of the video space. And they just seem to really understand and they hear us out and they, we have discussions and um, they've, you know, they've worked with Lucas with the amazing handle that they built with Condor Blue um, mm -hmm. and Samsung was involved in that. And uh, like, uh, SanDisk. I'm sorry. Yeah, SanDisk. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> uh, it starts with an S and it's another uh, company that makes hard drives. It's pretty close. I think Condor Blue is a, a good... Um, um, reference they're very much like condor blue in that way they just kind of feel like well because they are because lucas i mean like they're just cool people they're just one of us they're just regular regular joes who happen to also either own in the case of lucas or just what are you doing <laughs> i have the new black s52 cage oh, yeah. from condor blue um which i haven't installed i should have installed it in this call but I'll go ahead and kind of show you what it looks like. Um, yeah, please do. But basically all I'm saying is they're just regular people uh, who happen to work at these companies. And I, I think that that's really cool. Like they don't, they don't feel like corporate people at all. So here is the Condor blue cage on the S5 two X. Um, I didn't fully install it. I just kind of placed it together. I'm kind of holding it with my right hand here to keep it together. But um, obviously when it's all screwed in, it's good, but I love that they, color matched it you know condor blue is kind of known for their space gray color but you can kind of see even in the light here as it's sh shining it's very close to the same black that the s52 x has so obviously you still have the condor blue logo here mm -hmm. um maybe you could just sharpie or gaff tape that if it's bothering you i think um, uh they still snuck some blue in there i see they've got the blue um top bubble which yeah. you could technically come out uh, pull out it's a very useful feature again i think it's similar to the red button it's something that you know when you have it on a tripod you're going to want to be able to find it easily and uh, if it's dark you want to be able to see it so having a lighter color will make it easier to see um and i did i did talk to um Brandon there who who does a lot of the designing at Condor Blue and I noticed that all the black cages and the accessories still have the blue uh like turn knobs or like the the tightening mm -hmm. knobs and you know obviously there is a branding element to that but he was saying like genuinely he said I the reason that we kept them blue isn't just because of the branding it's also so that there's a a real visual cue to where you can touch and move things it's just kind of like the idea of like any, if you just hand your camera set up to somebody, you want them to just know where to go and do things. And it's just, a, it just simplifies the idea of like, you know, the blue thing is what I turn and what I tighten and what I pull, you know, makes so it you'll intuitive. Never, yeah. But from, it's like, yeah, okay. But you could say that to Lumix as well. And they still blacked out all the buttons. <laughs> so like, um, and they could, uh, they could, so counterpoint, they could do like an all black design with, and, and then make the knob space gray. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. There you yeah. go. So it's like a little compromise, you know? Yeah. And that's still in line with their, you hear that Lucas, uh, their colors. That's my idea. You can have it. Give us, give us a space gray. <laughs> knob yeah sick i'd be down with that yeah make everything yeah i don't want to see any i don't want to see this white on here lucas <laughs> i don't want to see this blue on here it clashes with my my all black camera although we do have white on the lenses i was i was thinking i was like lumix needs to make like an an x variant of all the lenses that's like a grayed out i think we're starting to get a little too uh needy aren't we i think it's fine <laughs> I think they did a great job. <laughs> I think for the most part, it's totally. what we what we want. And the few and compromises cage, they made. This with, cage looks great. Yeah, it looks great. The few compromises with the blue and the red totally makes sense. So. And here's, I mean, for reference, here's what the non-black cage looks like. Oh, you got two? Nice. Well, this is the one for the, remember, I, I did get it for the S5 too. Uh, yeah. I've had this since December. Right. Um, 
All you gotta do is text Lucas. He'll send it to you. I know. It doesn't feel right though. I need to. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, obviously you can see there's a huge difference between the standard space gray, which I do like. It has its own kind of, it's a very unique color way, which I, I think is why they chose it in the first place. It definitely, when you see it, you think Condor blue cause it's, it's got that kind of branding. Um, but I think they've embraced the fact that a bunch of video nerds are just just give us super. I mean, look at us, blacked out, black, black, black. And not your hat though, but close enough. Well, I every time I wear this hat, I'm so used to black hats. I look at myself. I'm like, is this is this okay? Like, I, <laughs> I almost feel weird. I'm like, does this look right? It's not. It's not okay, it. Dave. You should change. <laughs> I know you got a black one. What are you doing? I got one of each. Yeah, I did talk to them. I schmoozed so that I could get two because I love the design. All right, guys. So thank you for joining us again for another episode of the Golden Hour Podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to leave a rating and review in the Apple Podcast Player that allows us to get more discovery in the audio side of things. Also, if you're a Spotify user, feel free to uh, engage there as well. They have reviews there too. Yeah, some of and us still love you, Spotify users. <laughs> it's me. Well, I'm using all the I'm using all the stuff. I'm using the Spotify for podcaster system. Yeah. Um, and we're using it for our ads. And by the way, we have mentioned before, but uh, we do have some ads in the show and it's been great because guess what, Connor? We now have $100. We made $120 total. It's actually not bad. That's great. I mean, we'll use that to buy another broadcaster. I guess. Yeah, I was thinking about buying buying another one because I love it and you have mine. I have <laughs> so. yours. I stole it. Sorry. It's great. Thank you. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think the Vocaster is like 150. So we just need to wait a little bit longer and we'll be good to Watch go. Watch those ads, guys. Got to buy another Vocaster. <laughs> Come on. We need to. Yeah, the sp- we need a sponsor. The, <laughs> the Vocaster One is only 100 bucks. Ew. It's on sale. Let's go. And then it's 150 for the two which is what i have there yeah so if you want i could buy you the one and i could take my two back okay sure um, or we just wait a little longer and get another two yeah because there's there's often instances where there's two of us together yeah. or two people involved and if we have two now you can have four total that's pretty so. great that's pretty great anyways <laughs> you just I, I thought this was going to be the end but uh <laughs> now you just get to hear start. us talk about what we're going to buy <laughs> content baby <laughs> <laughs>